To live a good life, you have to come from a position of strength. What that means is to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to think the right thing consistently. You have to come from a place where there's as little fear as possible. And although it's useful to have the support of a community outside, there are many times when you are living in situations where the community is not there, where you're dealing with people who don't share the values of the Dharma, who have other priorities, other agendas. And you have to have your own inner strength to maintain your practice. In the face of those priorities and agendas, in other words, you have to learn how not to accept them, not to get sucked into other people's values when you're sure that your values are on the skillful side, wanting to act and speak and think in ways that are harmless and actually promote well-being, both for yourself and for the people around you. So you want both the body and the mind on your side. With the body, we're, we work with the breath. The breath is the most basic of all the elements in the body. It's what keeps us alive. And it's through the breath that we know the other elements of the body. We tend to think of ourselves as being the hard part of the body, the solid part of the body, and the breath comes in and out of that. But it's actually through the breath that we know the solidity or the warmth or the coolness of the body, the movement of the body. So you try to work with the breath in a way that feels refreshing, nourishing, strengthening. Not only while you're sitting here with your eyes closed, but as you go through the day. Try to keep that center very firmly inside. And keep your awareness filling the body as much as you can. As you're sitting here with your eyes closed, this is an ideal time to work with the details, the subtleties of how the breath energy is flowing, what kind of energy feels good right now, what kind of breathing feels good, and how do you breathe in a way that you're not squeezing energy out of the body. Our cartoon ideas of breathing often involve getting the breath out as much as possible. But when you're dealing with breath in the body, you don't have to squeeze that out. In fact, you want to keep it as full as you can. Think of every little cell in the body being filled and nourished, refreshed with energy. Ask yourself, are there any parts that feel starved, any parts that feel like they're not getting enough breath or the breath is being squeezed out of them? What way could you breathe so that they do feel full, refreshed, energized? All of them, all at once. This way good breath fills the body and your awareness fills the body as well. This is how you maintain your boundaries. If you're not filling your body with your awareness, you often let the emotional energy of other people come in and invade your space while you're talking with them, while you're trying to empathize with them. You take in their energy, and then you find that you're stuck with it. And it doesn't really accomplish anything. It's still possible to empathize with other people without trying to take in their energy, take in their pain. You know what pain is like. You know what suffering is like. But you also know that the best way not to get sucked into your own thought worlds is to be able to stand apart from them a bit. Observe them as events. See where they come from so you can actually do something about them. And the same principle applies to other people's thought worlds as well, other people's emotional worlds. You don't have to take them in. You can observe them. You can empathize without having to allow their energy to invade you. And this way you've got your body on your side. You're with the body. If you sense any fluctuations in the energy, you can ask yourself, was that from a physical cause, from a mental cause? And then deal with it. But often dealing with it, the best 
first line of defense is to work from the physical side. How can you change your breathing to mend that tear in your bodily energy, to reweave the energy, to darn it the same way you darn a hole in a sock, get everything back all connected again. So where you've got the body on your side. Then the next thing, of course, is to get the mind on your side. Well, this is to say, the mind covers over the fact that you have many minds, many ideas, many attitudes. There are many yous in there. And some of them are actually helpful for the practice, and some of them are not. So you try to get all the committee members on the same page. I once asked to John Fuhrung, what do you need to believe in order to do the practice? You have to do, believe in one thing, karma, the principle that your actions really do bear results. And you really can develop skillful actions. You're not stuck in old habits. You have choices. You can train the mind. And the quality of the mind determines the quality of the action. This is why we meditate, to get the mind in a good place, in good shape, so the actions that it chooses are skillful, harmless, beneficial. And the word action here means not only your physical actions and your words, but also the thoughts that go through the mind, because those are actions too. They have a result. There are certain patterns that you think over and over again. Those become ingrained in the mind. And then they're like ruts in snow as you're trying to drive down the road. Wherever the ruts go, you, your car gets pulled in that direction. That's where the nerve pathways have been connected. So you want to keep reminding yourself that your choices do matter. They are important. And even though the results of good actions may not show up immediately in your life. You can just chalk that up to past karma, because your past actions have results too. It wouldn't be fair to insist that I want my nice good actions in the present moment to have, that, have the power to shape my life, but I don't want the past things to have any power over my life. They will influence your choices, influence the range. Excuse me, influence the range of choices that you can choose from. And as long as you keep trying to choose the most skillful of the options available to you, you're opening up the possibility for more skillful and more skillful and more skillful opportunities. This is why the traditional definition of conviction in the practice is conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Because what he saw was that there is an aspect of the mind, there is an aspect of awareness, a process of awareness that doesn't die with the body, keeps going. In the same way that your awareness of a dream, when the dream ends, your awareness doesn't end. You dream another dream, and then there's another dream. If you ask, well, what was it that went from the first dream to the second dream, you realize that's, that's not the question. The dreams all happen right here. Wherever you're aware, it's always right here, whatever you're aware of. But your sense of what's around right here, right here is going to change. And what you're going to latch on to, to make it right here, is going to change too. Notice that here is something that's created by the mind, that sense of here or there. It's part of the process of becoming. And the things you latch on to become the seeds for different worlds of becoming. Unfortunately, you have choices. Your past karma may be like a field, as the Buddha says, filled with all kinds of potential seeds. And then what you water right here in the present moment, that's the seed that's going to grow. So you look to see what potentials are here right now that you can develop that will lead you in a skillful direction. 
and have the conviction that that's always the right choice, the harmless choice, the beneficial choice, the choice where you find that your benefit coincides with the benefit of other people. That's the direction you want to go in. And as you work on this process, you find it takes you deeper and deeper into the mind to see where in the mind's own dealings it's causing suffering to itself. The thoughts it latches onto that then create a sense of being burdened, constricted, restricted in your choices. You can see how that happens. And you try to ferret out the cause. What are the mental elements, the mental events that lead you in the direction of suffering? And what can you do to put an end to those events? How can you put an end to those cravings? How can you drop the cravings when you see them arise? This doesn't mean you live wholly without desire. In fact, there are certain desires that are an essential part of the path, the desire to do what's skillful, to abandon what's unskillful. Those kind of desires you nourish, but the desires that make you want to look for nourishment in sensuality, nourishment in creating more little worlds in the mind, the desire to destroy what you feel you are, those are the kinds of cravings you have to watch out for. You have to learn how to identify them. And getting to that level starts with trying to be skillful in your daily activities, because it's all of a piece. You're doing something that can either be skillful or unskillful. Then you follow that process into its more subtle levels. You discover that this issue of skillfulness and unskillfulness is what underlies the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are ways of looking at experience. We're not so much concerned as about who you are, simply concerned with what actions are skillful what actions are not. What's causing suffering, what's not. And as you focus on these things, you find that the mind gets greater and greater strength to make the right choices, because you see very clearly that if you make the wrong choices, you suffer. Not only you, people around you suffer as well. So that regardless of what kind of world is presented or world of possibilities is presented by your past actions, your past karma, you don't have to suffer. That's when the mind is really strong. It goes beyond even the strength of conviction and strength of persistence and mindfulness and concentration and discernment, they finally arrives at a strength that's totally independent. Of course, not just conviction, it's knowledge that keeps you going. For you've confirmed it in yourself. You develop that strength within yourself, and you can see how far it can lead you. So when we talk about conviction in the Buddha's awakening, it basically means convictions in your own ability to keep making the skillful choices. And then by exercising that ability, you find greater and greater strength inside, and you do become more independent. You're less and less dependent on the community around you. And that's what the Buddha means when he says freedom, that kind of strength. When you're no, no longer constricted by the, the options around you, you no longer have to suffer when things are bad, suffer when things are good. You don't have to suffer at all. So it's important that you maintain the conviction that this is possible. 
regardless of what the people around you say, regardless of what your work is like, or what the economy is like, or what politics are like, or all the other things we get obsessed, at, obsessed about in the world outside. You need this ability to be totally free and independent. And it's not just a selfish process when you do this. Because remember, when you're dependent on other people, it's like feeding on them. You're trying to get strength from them. And the world is a feeding frenzy. And so it's good to have at least one person pulling out of the frenzy. One less burden for the world. One more good example. So do what you can to maintain this sense of strength, strength of conviction. Any relationships that tear it down, any activities you find that wear it away. You have to ask yourself, do I really need those relationships? Do I really need those activities? You've got to give this path toward freedom that's built out of these strengths. You've got to give that your highest priority. if you want to keep it strong. Keep yourself strong. Keep the practice strong. Otherwise, what are you doing? <laughs>